This morning we're talking to uh, Simon Holman from Castlefield and Simon if you want to introduce yourself and do a bit about Castlefield that'd be great. Certainly thanks Mike and thanks for uh, inviting me on um, to try and give our views on uh, on greenwashing. Um, yeah well I've, I've been in the industry for just over 20 years now and half of that uh, the last half's been at Castlefield um, in, in Manchester so it's uh, we're, a, we're an integrated uh, financial uh, firm covering wealth management, investment management, advice and fund administration. And I've been working on the investment management side uh, since I joined. Um, and in terms of looking at greenwashing and what might originally have been called uh, ethical investment, but obviously that's that's moved on in the terminology. Uh, I was responsible for setting up our, um, our, our investment approach, really sort of defining it and developing it in, in how we can give clients what they want, how we can reflect their values, uh, launching our first uh, ethical fund and developing our, our services um, and that's developed uh, over the years uh, now a lot of my time is is primarily spent um, talking with clients and, and, and working with the clients um, rather than doing the stock research myself but that's um, because we have a, a, a much grown team to, uh, to to do the the heavy lifting and the uh, and the unpicking of what of what companies and funds are up to um, and the other point perhaps to notice um about Castlefield is we're an employee-owned business, so uh, we're all we're all co-owners. We're all directly invested in the company, and we kind of think that's important because um, the way we see it is that success for our clients results in our success. So it's um, you know we're, we're very much aligned with trying to make sure that clients um, clients get a good outcome and get their values reflected. It's an interesting thing as well that the um, greenwashing didn't wasn't a thing when there were only ethical funds because essentially ethical funds had clearly defined parameters and as a consequence every once in a while you'd maybe find a fund manager that said they didn't do something and you have to point out to them maybe you know that's you've missed something but in the main companies didn't set up and say we've got these avoidance criteria and then sneak things in that actually breach that whereas because of sustainability and all the myriad of measures that are in place you now have that problem of what's sustainable to one person isn't necessarily sustainable to another and so greenwashing has i mean it's interesting that it's been around since the mid 80s as a term um, originally aimed at an oil company imagine but it has become well it's obviously become such a worry that the fca has brought out uh, legislation around making sure that it is not happening does it do you get asked about greenwashing often um i mean i think i think typically our our clients have have started to form a view that they could probably trust our our approach but they may also certainly have you know there, there may be some questions there about what they're invested in and where, where they'll want to try and make sure or they may have heard about something and, and be concerned about it so it is it is something that is is on people's minds i think that they want to have that confidence that they they are investing in a way that that fits with their values and um uh, and they're not just handing their money over for it to be um uh, you know to, to, to be invested in a, in a completely different way to to what their expectation is because well, the other problem is one person's greenwashing is another person's acceptable. So it's how you how you deal with that. Uh, the, the, the sort of the nuance there. And I suppose with you being a smaller asset manager and a lot of it being bespoke, you are able to uh, tailor to people's views. If you have a one, if you if you have a sort of a fund approach, it is a different thing in that people have to accept that there are broad brushes, but within that there will be some things that people look at and think that doesn't seem as sustainable as I'd hoped but overall I suppose it, it, it's trying to catch the the general direction isn't it yes um very much so and and the point you made Mike about um where, where we can do sort of bespoke personalized um selections investment selections for a client is 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 very very true and very, um, and very pertinent but I think one of the one of the ways we go about it and it's one of the ways which should be yeah, easily achievable for for any investment manager that wants to commit to doing it is when you when you have a bank of clients who have values it's 
it's not a great leap of imagination or, or too much effort to actually see what are the common themes um, to work out, okay, well, we can see that typically clients want to avoid this, aren't particularly um, fussed whether they whether we include or exclude this. So, you know, you very clearly get what the common themes are. And then when it comes to a fund approach, as you say now, obviously that's that's something more of a one size fits all. But when you have this huge bank of information over here telling you what people generally feel, then that directly informs how we um, how we approach our, our services where where it's um uh, it's funds and clients recognise that their approach is taking something that's more uh, more standardised. Uh, I suppose in trying to sum it up succinctly, the way we go about it is we don't think it's about trying to say these are Castlefield's values you're fine accepting them aren't you it's saying we we try to sort of hold up the mirror to clients what are your values we'll then absorb that and and try and make it as uh, replicable as possible for the widest possible audience and how do you okay with the greenwashing thing how are we going to make it stops probably a bit of a pipe dream but how do we restore the confidence that seems to be leaking away well I, th I think actually talking about the client values um it's something that it's the onus on on intermediaries such as ourselves to to do the work and, and do the looking and make sure that it's the client values that are the priority rather than the manufacturer's whim um you know it's it's been it's been coming for a while um probably that we've had to get to this situation that lots of people have seen oh here's a nice bandwagon to make money from let's quickly rush out a load of products and uh, and and tell everyone how uh, how super whizzy they are and, and they're meeting their esg and sustainability requirements um i think probably the phrase that might come to mind is uh making trying to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear um when uh, when we look at what's um actually uh, within them um and it 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 really is about it it needs to be led by what clients actually want, not what's uh, what's being um, pushed onto them. Um, I think there was there's the phrase in um, in the new regulation that's coming out is about unexpected investment types, and I think that really gets to the heart of it. Is it's yeah, it's trying to protect clients from waking up and find out what are these unexpected um, points, at, and there are ways that you can you can go about doing that. Um, I think so. For example, are are the investment managers, uh, are the fund management houses, do they have integrated teams where the fund managers and the uh, and the researchers and, and people focused on um, environmental, social and governance issues are all part of the same team? Because when you do that, and that's the approach we take, everybody is sh sharing the same mindset rather than an approach where you have a team of people who are doing research saying, well, these, these companies are involved in practices that aren't aren't very good um and then you've got a separate team of fund managers who are just thinking about how do i um uh, how do i juice my performance and get my bonus this year and uh, and i'm sure that i'm sure they're doing something good i'm sure that company's just put out a very nice uh, sustainability report with uh, 182 pages talking about their, their their great global good um yeah that kind of conflict of interest and tension is is something to try and avoid and when really you, you want everybody to be thinking uh, in the same way um, and perhaps the other one is, are, are the providers, are, are they pure play? So, you know, in terms of all we do is try and invest um, responsibly and sustainably. We don't have another team or even other funds which um, uh, are saying, OK, oh, well, these clients want to invest in fossil fuels. They don't care about the planet or climate change. So we'll give them a solution um, because we think that's uh, that's inherently contradictory. We think client outcomes in, will be better in the long term from uh, adopting um, you know, adopting values, trying to invest sustainably, trying to invest for the long term. And so it makes no sense to also then say, but these things that we don't think are going to perform in the long term, we're going to invest over here. And um, you know, how, how can we justify that? So, um, yeah, that's um, is 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 a fund that's being uh, launched um, or, or a fund that's available. Is that just um, sort of you know a, a marketing ploy? Because actually, the bulk of the, the company's funds are investing in everything and anything, oils, 
arms, tobacco, you name it. Um, um, and, you know, does that, uh, what, what implications does that have for the credibility of their ESG fund or what they might be sneaking in there? I think one of the difficulties, the, the unexpected thing is like, who decides what's unexpected? The only way we're going to sell the unexpected is for asset managers to list every company and what they do. Because giving top tens, you know, we can look at top tens and know what those companies do, but IFAs who don't have the, the, the resources can't do that, and clients possibly even more so, in some cases less so. But the solution has to be that you list every company and you say what they do, and then you get caught. Because that point about the 182-page report, every, not every, almost every company out there is printing stuff that says they're getting better. And if, if all you need to do to get some sort of a fit within a, an ESG profile is to say, we're improving, then that isn't actually, that's going to make greenwashing worse, not better. Because the reality is, if your KPIs or whatever it is you're using as a measure are saying that in five years, we'll be producing a little bit less pollution, and that's all you need, then that's a huge problem. Um, and one I think the FCA is going to struggle with, but that's for them. Um, and finally, how do we get the people who are genuinely, not genuinely is the wrong word because it makes it so the other people are intentionally not, but how do the, the ones who are leading the way, if you like, the ones at the forefront, how do we get to differentiate? How does an advisor, how does a client pick that how do they get to the, the the point of that i mean perhaps in part it does come down to what transparency is offered um by the manager so the the, the point you just made about not just a top 10 but full full disclosure of holdings um you need to be a provider um and whether it's our services or our funds here you need to be we need to be transparent we need to say uh, we do publish full holdings lists um, on uh, on the website. Um, that that kind of thing. You need to make as much information as possible and set out uh, very you know, try and be as simple and as clear as possible. In this is what we mean. This is what we mean by responsible investment, or this is what we mean by sustainable investment. This is how we do it. This is what we invest in, um, and also be transparent about what. Um, what, what checks there might be. So for example, we have an external advisory committee, which is made up of uh, some clients and some external experts. And twice a year, we meet with them. We talk about funds, we talk about themes, we talk about companies, we talk about our voting policy and run things past them and, and have a discussion. So they're providing that kind of external sort of, not audit as it were, but, but independent assessment. Um, just to sort of make sure that we, you know, we're trying to keep focused on what's what's right for clients, what are, what are key issues, um, and the more that that can be made available and made available easy easily, then whether it's for um, for advisors or, or clients ultimately to be able to see it, um, that level of transparency and information should help uh, make decisions or or have the comfort that these unexpected investments aren't going to be um, suddenly cropping up. You see, I think the thing, and I completely agree, I think the thing is that managers need to be more proud of the countries that they invest into. Because you don't just, if you're running a tracker, you don't have that connection, but you spend a huge amount of time, as do all act, active asset managers, choosing the companies. So make more of that. You know, talk about why it is that you really like company A rather than company B in the same sector. Talk about what it is that you think gives the, the growth profile or the sustainability profile or the combination of both, rather than just sort of hiding behind something as though, because I don't think many managers are particularly unwilling to be transparent. They just, they've never felt the connection. I think it's probably more so with retail than with discretionary because on the retail side, you don't actually meet the client. You know, you have, you have client meetings with individuals who will sit down and say, Simon, explain to me why you bought that or what you like about this company and you can if you're if you're running um and most of the companies on our you, you're obviously a, a bit of a uh, you know you've got to put in both camps most of the organizations on the database run funds and as such 
they will they will have surveys and interactions and things with clients, but they don't have that direct client experience of saying, uh, that's not what I expected. And you then the, you then reassessing or being able to make a coherent argument. And I think that trying to get more of that, more of the, this is why this is a fantastic company, but please not another example of Orsted because that's all that everyone talks about. Uh, I'm, I, I, I absolutely agree as well. Um, and, and it is, those kind of stock stories are are a great way of um, uh, of, of bringing it to life uh, for for clients for for investors and, and something that, um, that that more can be made of and um, yeah I think I think going right back to to what you said at, at the start about um, back in the back when it was just sort of ethical funds negative screening avoidance um, it was sort of quite simple but actually now the way the feel that the markets evolved is uh, many investors they, they do want to hear about the positives they do want to understand what good am I doing with my money and actually being able to say well this company you're invested in and this is what it's doing and you bring it to life and it, and it really resonates with them um, and and you can emphasize that and, and actually sometimes you can say well you might not have known this about this company but here's what we found about it and here's what we really like and um, and it really sits very well with them. I think that the most powerful is when you get a positive message about a company that people had a neutral or negative view of. Because if you tell them about a, a, a Vestas wind or a, you know, a solar or something similar, they expect it to be a positive. But if you tell them about a, a household products company that they, they use, but they have no idea how enlightened they are about any number of social or environmental policies, that's the point where the client thinks, this is where the value is coming from, because actually that's something I'm, I now feel better about both being an investor and in some ways a customer of those people. Because, you know, there are, there are a lot of companies, this is another bizarre thing, there are companies out there who don't want to put their head above the parapet and say, actually, we're doing more good than you realise, because they know they're going to get shot down. And it's really sad that that's become the case, that people don't want to be proud of what the good they're doing, they'd rather just sort of hide within the herd. Yes, um, it, it, it is it is a crying shame. Um, but again, I think that that comes down to the uh, the fund management industry to um, to try and shine a light and, and to try and unpick the or, or find find the good that's being done. And I think one of the one of the ways we've looked at it for um, over a, a number of years is saying, OK, well, you know, we're looking at this company. Um, it might not be. Um, I, that's just I'm trying to think. Yeah, but think of think of a, a sector. Yeah, let's say let's say it was a supermarket. Um, a supermarket chain by its nature, you know, it, it's not set out. Its primary purpose isn't to try and do environmental good or social good. But you can have a look at it and you can say, well, what are they doing on their environmental front? And then you can say, okay, well, they've got evidence of how many uh, rooftops they're covering in solar panels. What they're doing on reducing their water usage, various environmental things where are they sourcing some of their um, any of their food products from on the social side are they paying the living wage or yeah have uh, have they got sort of fair kind of pension contributions are they looking to help ex-offenders get back into work yeah there's all these myriad criteria where by taking a bit of time and effort to go and find them you can you can start to sort of shine as I say shine that light where companies aren't really necessarily shouting about it or, or it's not being heard and um and then it does boil down to yes as you say consumers will think actually i'm quite happy to uh, to go there or to support that business because i know what they're doing i think supermarkets are always a great example because pretty much everybody uses them and they think they're all much of a muchness they tend to go on price and then when you discover but i think i read today that sainsbury's profits are down because of the support they've given to households who can't afford to buy all of their shopping so that they have subsidized the price of some of their goods to make sure that the staples although they seem to have gone up by an enormous amount they haven't actually they're not a true reflection of the price that's a that's a great reflection on the fact that they have a they've adopted a there's a slightly commercial bit part to it but it's also it's, it's a social attitude they didn't have to do that whether it has a, a, a knock-on effect is, is another matter entirely but people knowing so i think people he, hearing good stories about where they're investing and about uh, advantageous social good i think the other thing is we i think why greenwashing has become a problem is because there's 
a lot of concentration on the positive, which is understandable. But we mustn't lose sight of the fact that there are some red lines that people don't want to cross. And that those red lines seem to have become very, oh, that ethical investment, it's, you know, that avoidance thing, that's very last century. And actually, for most people, it's really not. It doesn't mean total avoidance. It does mean let's at least, you know, we, most of us have got motor cars, but we'd like to be doing something else. And so let's find a way to be doing something else rather than just saying, oh, well, let's have some more Shell, Exxon, BP, whoever it might be. I'm not naming any specifically, but they, you know, all the oil companies, they, they are needed currently. We can't go from where we are now to no oil overnight. So how do we get there? I think is part of the ongoing discussion. And yeah, and I think it it also lends itself to um, by by adding in the positive. It is about what what is who, who's going to benefit. How can we invest in companies that are um, that are in the right kind of areas? So the point about about the motor cars, one of the uh, one of the criticisms that's always leveled is well, you know, how much infrastructure is there for electric vehicles? How can people get around? Well. We are where we are now, but the answer isn't to say, well, you know, electric vehicles aren't, aren't going to work because we know that the manufacturers are actually making the ranges last longer and longer. But who's actually going to roll out the infrastructure so that we can build it so that actually it makes it easier for um, uh, for consumers to, to adapt if, yeah, if, if they want to go down the route of having a, um, an electric vehicle? Um, I'm sure, you know, many Many investors who want who, who want to invest sustainably would rather we had um, uh, sort of national public transport networks that actually worked um, and you know and, and could in, could invest in um, the, uh, on a global basis. I'm sure there are, you know there are plenty of opportunities around the world, even if uh, in the UK it's um, it's not particularly fruitful. But it's that kind of mentality of well, don't just look at it as a as a stumbling block or a, or a hurdle or a closed door. Who's who's the company or which are the companies that are offering the solutions and um, meaning that in 5, 10, 20, 30 years time, um, it, will, it will have changed and, and actually we'll be able to, to do all these things um, in the same way that the stick used to beat renewable energy was always its cost. Oh, it needs to be subsidized. It's too expensive. And the cost reductions have been phenomenal. Um, and, you know, in, in the space of, I don't know, 10, 15 years, it's, it's completely turned on its head. Um, and I think as, as investors, you know, try investing, trying to invest sustainably, you know, that's that's what we're looking for. And that's our responsibility is to find find those kind of um, opportunities for uh, for clients. It's kind of interesting if that one, isn't it? Because the renewables needing to be subsidised, the, the subsidies are all now going to fossil fuel companies. So that completely makes sense, doesn't it? We've got a planet that's getting too hot and we're giving money to the companies that are going to keep it nice and toasty for us. I think that might be a good point on which to end. Thank you very much for your time. Pleasure, Mike. Lovely to see you after such a long time as well. Exactly, yes. <laughs>